things that we have been in this seri- doing in this series is to sort of check out the landmarks in the Bible, almost like we're going down a river and we're on a raft and we're looking to see where are the landmarks that tell us where we're going in the story of God that finds its center point in Jesus. And today, we're going to talk about identity. We're going to talk about our identity in Jesus. And our series' big idea is, what I believe determines who I am becoming. And so if you're a person who likes to fill in those blanks, then fill that in. If you're a person who hates it when we miss a blank, then your job is to raise your hand and say, we missed a blank, and I really need you to do that because I just blow past them. I'm just reading this. I figure you already know where we're going. So the first one is, what I believe determines who I am becoming. The big idea for today is that I believe I'm significant because of my position as a child of God. And what I want you to do is to circle the word significant. I know I had the blank in there. I believe I am significant because of my position as a child of God. What it means to be significant is to be someone worth paying attention to. That's what it means to be significant. When someone is significant, we say, she is worth paying attention to. And I think we all ask the question at some point, am I worth someone worth paying attention to? And we all ask, where is that place? Where is home? Where do I belong? Where am I known? What's my identity? What's home base for me? And from the story of Jesus, we discover that an overwhelmingly gracious invitation has been made to us to become part of God's family. Will you read this scripture aloud with me? We're going to read John 1.12. We'll read it once together, and then we'll go back over and we'll read it again, and I'll try and keep an even pace here, okay? First time, uh, I'm, I know it'll be just a little murmur, but go ahead. Let's, let's try it out loud. Use your, use your indoor voice the first time, okay? Yet to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Awesome. Okay, second time. Yet to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Notice two things. The first thing here is that you have a choice. And the second one is this is an offer for those to pl- who place trust in Jesus, okay? Here's another fill in the blank. You have been welcomed into a personal relationship with God. He has given you a choice. How personal is this relationship? Just how personal is God's invitation to you? Let's read this, John 3.16. Can you read this with me? For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in Him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. Notice this, whoever trusts. Whosoever trusts. Trusts what? Trust that God loves you, that God so love the world. Who's the world? Us, me, even somebody from Toledo, Ohio. You don't have to be special. You can even be from Toledo. Center stage in the biblical story is an invitation to trust God, but it's not because nothing has happened. It's because something has happened. The personal the, the story of God is centered in on the fact that God united Himself to humanity forever in the person of Jesus Christ. He hooked Himself up to us. He did not remain unknown to us. He made His identity connected to humanity, which is weird because we're fragile. We burp. We eat food. We eat overeat food. You know, we, we're loud and brash and we're angry and fight each other and sometimes we don't take showers and we stink and, you know, you, you think, why would God become a part of the frailness and the isness of humanity? Is it because He wants us to know how much He loves us? Could it be He wants us to know that He is bound to us? You know, I think it's easy for sometimes for us to think that God may have got things started like the divine clockmaker. 
And he got it going, or maybe it's like a divine perpetual motion machine. He got it going, he set it up, it's got all the gears, everything works, it's going tick, 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 tick forever. And he just sits back in his lazy boy, drinks a beer, and watches the Chiefs. And that's all he has to do. Or is it that God has invested in somehow some special way and bound himself to us as humans and been with us in the most personal way he could be? You remember how Jesus, the stories of Jesus going around and when people asked him for healing, he extended his hands and he touched all the people who were unclean and something new happened when he did that. Something came out from him and made them clean. Their uncleanness did not affect him at all. He came to humanity, bound himself to us, and brought something new, brought some healing, brought some power. And he asks us to trust in this because it's evidence that he is personally invested in us as humanity. God gave something himself. In fact, the best news ever, in my opinion, is Jesus. If you're asking me what the good news is, we we say gospel. Gospel just means good story, good news. What is that good news? In one word, Jesus. Because if you get Jesus, you get everything. If you get Jesus, you get the posture of God. You get the attitude of God. You see God clearly because God is not distant. God is not just sitting back in his lazy boy, drinking a beer and watching the Chiefs. God is postured differently. God is postured towards you like, like a mama looking for her child. Okay? Oh, come here, come here, come here, come here, come here. This is a 52-year-old man imitating a mama looking for, Okay? <laughs> Right? The po- what's, the, what's the posture when your child is coming towards you? A child is coming towards you. What's your posture? No, your posture is this. And I think a lot of times the image we have of God is this massively strong warrior keeping his distance and always remaining pure and strong like some superhero in a cape. But the posture of God has been to invest himself in us through the person of Jesus Christ to connect himself to us in our weakness by enduring that weakness. Coming to be with us, knowing what it means to be human and to face death. And it's this. And what Jesus reveals is that his posture towards us has always been this even though we may not have seen it. Jesus is the evidence of that personal invitation of a loving God has invited us into his family. You have been lovingly invited into his family. Did I miss a blank yet? Good, we're on track. You have been lovingly invited into his family, and Jesus is the evidence. I'm going to read 1 Corinthians 3.16. It's in your notes. Don't you know that you yourselves are God's temple And that God's Spirit dwells in your midst. My note says dwells, dwells. I guess it must be really important. Or I just like to spell the word dwells. Don't you know that you yourselves are God's temple and that God's Spirit dwells in your midst? That somehow God's presence is with you, is with me. What is that all about? I want to, this is where it gets fun for me anyway. I don't know if it's going to be fun for you, but I'm just going to describe something in a perspective that you might, might not have had before. If you, if you read um, history of ancient Near Eastern peoples, the concept they had of a temple was that a temple and their gods was a place where heaven and earth met, or their God could connect with the people, right? And the temples are still around, they still exist today. But even at the time of these stories, right, of the oldest of the Old Testament stories, the concept of as a temple was a place where heaven and earth would meet. And it was no different for the Israelite people when God built them a temple, right? He said, I will live in a tent with you. 
my people. You're nomadic. You're in the desert. You're wandering around, and so we need a tent. And so where you go to here, you can pack up the tent and go, but I'm going to be with you. I am your God, and I will be with you, and you will be my people, and I'm going to be here in this tent, and you build the tent this way, and you make it of these very nice materials, and I'll show you how to do it, and then I'm going to be in a little room in this tent, and inside that room called the Holy of Holies, I'm going to be actually in a little box inside of the little room inside of a tent. And the little box is going to have to be made this way of these dimensions out of this wood. And it's going to have to have these things on the top of it. Okay, It's going to have to look just so because this is really important. I'm going to be with you and I am, I am the real deal. I'm holy. I'm pure. And you cannot come into my presence by be, with being um, impure. And so he created an entire system for the nation of Israel so that they could become pure to be near to his presence, but only a few could actually be inside the tent, and only one at one time of the year could actually be in the Holy of Holies. Only one person could be in his presence, and that was called the high priest. And that high priest, when he was purified and went through all the rituals, could go into the Holy of Holies, but when he went in, they put a little rope around his leg, because just in case he hadn't done the purification correctly, all of it, thoroughly, He might die in God's presence because of God's purity and his own impurity, and they would have to drag him out, okay? And they couldn't go in because they knew for certain that they were not the high priest, and only the high priest was allowed in the presence of the Holy of Holies and God, okay? This is God being present, the meeting place of heaven and earth inside of this tent in the Holy of Holies, okay? That's then. Now we're moving forward all the way to the time of Christ, and Jesus comes and says that he will make his presence with us. That's different. This is is a box inside of a room, inside of a tent, and you can't touch it, and only one person can go in, and if they do it wrong, they're going to die. And all the way over here to Jesus says, I will come and be present with you. When they considered the meeting place of heaven and earth over here in the temple, it was like this was the hot spot. Now Jesus has come and said, I will come and make my presence with you and you will be my portable Wi-Fi hotspot. And wherever you go, I am with you and I am present to everyone around you, right? You see the difference? It's over here, you had to do all kinds of things to make yourself pure in order to go into a nearness to God And even then, only one person could actually be in the presence of God. And that very presence right here, Jesus says, I'm going to put that in you. Does that change your identity? I will make my home with you. You are my temple. You are the connecting place between heaven and earth. It's new. It's different. It's Wi-Fi. You've got the password. People have access to the network because of what Jesus Christ and His presence is doing in you. Do you get the contrast? Old and new. Old and new. Something has happened which is more personal than God ever did in the past. And I think what it reveals is that God has always been doing this. He has always been the mama. He has always been the good papa. Right? He has always been the welcoming one, opening the arms, saying yes to the children who want to come to him, always leaning forward. The posture has always been bent towards us. And Jesus is the evidence of that. And he invites us into this so we can find our identity as a child of God over here because he wants to make his home with you. Now, when God began things, I probably skipped a blank here, sorry. <clears throat> That's just so fun for me. I just like moving from the left into the right and right into the left. Okay, where was I? Um, Did I say you've been lovingly invited to his family? I did say that. Thank you very much. I did. 1 Corinthians 13. I did temples for this. Okay. Okay, so what's happening? (laughs) This transformation, what God's doing in us. Picture Plato, okay? This thing, God's presence in us, is reshaping us like we reshape Plato. play The whole purpose of Plato is to make something, then mash it up, right? Wad it up, mash it up, do it again, mix it with the other colors, put it through the little meat grinder, and make Plato sausage. <laughs> There's always something new that you do 
with Play-Doh, right? It it requires your hands to craft something new. And Ephesians 2.10 says, for we are God's handiwork. God's been working on us like Play-Doh. That His presence with us is creating something new. It's almost like in the beginning there was humanity, and now there's humanity 2.0. There is a transformation made possible by God's nearness, by His personal connection to humanity, by investing Himself with humanity, hooking Himself up with humanity, becoming one of us and saying, I will make my home with you. You will become my temple. I will make my presence here with you. And in the process, something new begins to happen, right? It molds us into people who are on His mission. It molds us into people who do His work. God is making us new, and He is crafting us into people who do life in a beautiful new way. God now makes Himself known through... Now, there's another one, right? Do your work. What is it? God's family does His work. Didn't I say that one? God's family does His work. (laughs) Underline that. Great. All right. God now makes himself known through you. You know, God doesn't need the temple anymore. He has you. He has you. And he's creating you to be a mission, a person who represents. Okay, in the very beginning, this is real fun for me too. How much time do I have left? Woohoo! I got some time. We'll keep you here all day. Let's read Genesis 1.26. Then God said, let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness, so that they may rule over the fish and the sea and the birds and the sky, over the livestock and all the wild animals, and over all the creatures that move along the ground. We were meant to do something. Humanity was meant to do something. We were meant to be in the image of God. What does it mean to be in the image of God? What does it mean to be the image of anything? It means to bear the likeness of Right? And in this case, it means to be, to do things like God does things. Because God's intent was never to make a world of brokenness and war and oppression and slavery and hatred and selfishness. He created something beautiful. He brought order out of chaos. Genesis says that the Spirit of God hovered over the waters and everything was empty and void. And the Hebrew is tohu vavohu, which means waste and wild. Wasn't anything formed that anybody could use would be any good to anybody until the Spirit of God moved over it and ordered it in such a way that now life can flourish. And what He wanted out of us was to enjoy His creation and make it flourish more. Connect things that need to be connected. Build houses. Do plumbing. Grow bigger tomatoes. The intention was for us to enjoy the potential of this world that God had created for us and put it into order. But he said, do it my way. I know what's going to work. I've created it in such a way where it's going to work if you do this. But if you go off and if you do it on your own, you're going to create problems. And it's going to result in death. It's going to result in destruction. It's going to be ripples of chaos that just keep going out and forming more ripples of chaos. So do it my way. And of course, what's the story? We didn't do it his way did it our way. We said, no, 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 we got this, right? So what ends up happening is that instead of bearing the image of God in the way that God would do things and ruling this earth, bringing things in order in the way that lines up with the wisdom of God, we did it our way, and it ends up being destructive, and everything goes to oppression. The stories from Genesis from 1 to 10 is just powers and kingdoms of people have come to power and rulers who make images in their own image, right? When the gods, when the the kings come to power, what do they do? They make statues and they ask the people to worship the statues because they represent the king. But we were always meant to represent God, not to represent ourselves. And our kings and all the people that have power over our nations always make idols to themselves instead of pointing to God. And so God said by the end of Genesis 10, I'm done with you guys. He did it through Noah and the flood and said, I'm done with you guys. I'm wiping you out except for you, Noah. I'll give you a chance. I see something in you. But then even after Noah, it didn't go so well. 
It didn't get any better, and God had to start over. And so this time he chooses a guy named Abraham, and he says, I'm going to do a restart in Abraham. I'm going to call this guy, make him a covenant, make him a promise, and through this guy and his descendants, I am going to bless everybody in the entire world. The Lord said to Abram, Go from your country, your people, and your father's household to the land I will show you. I will make you into a great nation, and I will bless you. And I will make your name great, and I will be a, you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you. Whenever curses you, I will curse, and all the peoples on earth will be blessed through you. And here's the fill in the blank. Belonging to Abraham meant belonging to God. Oh, did I miss a blank? Okay. God now makes himself known through you. You represent him to all the earth. Okay, blah, blah, blah. Belonging to Abraham meant belonging to God. Now we're on to this one, right? Okay, and the one that comes after it is this one. Belonging to Abraham meant acting like him and being obedient to God. And if you were going to belong to God's people, you had to belong to Abraham. And you had to be obedient to everything that God had commanded Abraham and Abraham's people to do. So if you were a man, circumcision, or you did not belong, it's part of the deal. Women, you can say thank you, that was not applicable. It meant that you had to eat a certain way, and you had to have a certain rhythm to your life. And when you read all these stories in the Old Testament, what you get is a sense that these people had their own culture, and God had given it to them. And he said specifically, I'm doing this so that you will represent me to the rest of the nations. I want you to be my peculiar people, and he made them a peculiar people. But I'm doing this so that you will represent me to the rest of the nations. Well, if you know the story, they loved him, they loved him not. They loved him, they loved him not. They loved him, they loved him not. They trusted him, they forgot him. They were with him, they abandoned him. And the story never got to the place where God wanted it to get to until Jesus. When God said through Abraham, I will bless all the nations, I will bless the world through you, you read in the New Testament that Jesus was of Abraham. And he comes on the stage and says, I'm the answer to that. And here's how I'm going to do that. I'm going to represent God to you in such a way that it will be unmistakable to you, unmissable to you, what the nature of God is. It's going to be self-sacrificing, enemy-embracing, other-oriented love. It's going to be you not missing this, and you'll never be able to see this again, right? Jesus says, this is God. This is the posture of God. Whatever you've seen before, whatever you've thought before, whatever you thought that God might have been, if you thought God was big and scary and always clad in leather and carrying gleaming swords, this is God, other-oriented, enemy-embracing, self-sacrificing, humble God who always created humanity out of love and for the purpose of flourishing. And through Jesus Christ now gives an opportunity for everyone, even if you are not of Abraham, everyone to become a child of God. And he not only says that you can hang with me over here, but he says, I'm coming to hang with you. I'm coming to place my identity in you. And if you will trust in what Jesus has done, that Jesus is the real Adam and the real Joshua and the real David, the best one, the one that honors God. If you will trust in that, then you will be, you'll move from humanity to humanity 2.0. And a transformation will begin to happen in you as you claim the identity of Jesus Christ. As you put your trust in him over time, he begins to do a work inside of you. He begins to mold you like the Play-Doh. And you become a new creation, a humanity 2.0 that reflects God and the, the God who's doing this, the God who loves, the God who hates oppression, the God who hates slavery, the God who hates it when we use power to bash each other on the head and keep each other out, the God who loves it when we lean forward and say, okay, everyone, everywhere, all the time is welcome. This is the identity that he says you can have. 
and you do have when you place your trust in Jesus. Now I'm completely lost. Completely lost. All right, we'll start over. Or we'll just start on the last page. Okay, got that. Yep. All right, can we go back to John 1.12 again? I think we can. Let's read that again. John 1.12, Yet to all who did receive Him, to those who believed in His name, He gave the right to become children of God, children who can call Him Father. Belonging to Jesus now means belonging to God. Let's read Romans 8.14. Read that together. For those who are led by the Spirit of God are the children of God. And you're led by the Spirit of God if you're placing your trust increasingly and continually in Jesus. He's working with you. It's a process. Sorry, there's no easy fix. <laughs> you're in the process of becoming new. When you start with Plato, what do you do? You take some time to create what needs to be created, and that's what God is doing in us. And the more we lean in, the more He partners with us in that transformation. But again, we choose. He never imposes it on us. If you don't want Him, you don't get Him. He won't push Himself on you. He's not a God with a sword beating you over the head and saying, I love you and you must love me. His posture is always bent towards you in an invitation, always saying, welcome. You choose. You choose. But for those of us and for those of you who have placed that trust in Jesus, your identity through the Spirit of God is to be the child of God. That's the family. That's the reality. This is humanity, humanity 2.0. You're now humanity 2.0. In Romans 8, we read, Now if we are children, then we are also heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ. Indeed, we share in His sufferings, if indeed we share in His sufferings, in order that we may also share in His glory. You know, glory is a complicated word in the Bible, but one of the ways you can look at it is reputation. If we share in His sufferings, in order that we may also share in His reputation. That's powerful in my book. Next, fill in the blank. I receive my significance by placing my identity in Jesus. Remember, significance means something that we want to look to, something that is not overlooked, something that's important to look to. That's where we receive our significance, by placing our identity and our trust in Jesus. What that does is it gives us a new identification card. And on that card, it reads, Child of God. And that identity can never be taken away from us. You might lose your job. You might lose your career. You might lose a marriage. You might lose a child. You might lose some valuable possessions. You can't lose your identity in Jesus. It's yours. Child of God. He loves you. He's inviting you. His posture is always towards you. What happens when we continually place our trust in Jesus as the new human? What happens to us? I couldn't resist this one. Let's read this, John 13, 35. By this will everyone know you are my disciples if you love one another. If you simply begin to look more and more like Jesus, it will be evident to the entire world whose spirit you are being led by. I think it's appropriate. God tells us we can call him Abba, Father. Da-da! <laughs> Thank you, God, for that one. <laughs> we are identified as a child of God. And we place our trust in God. And we place our trust in Jesus. And there is a transformation he eagerly wants to make in us so that we go out into this world and we are known by our love. It becomes our identity. Will you pray with me? <clears throat> Jesus, we've said that what we believe 
determines who we are becoming. And I pray that more and more we can believe that you have invited us into the nearest relationship that we can imagine. That you have come and made your home with us if we place our trust in you. I just pray that we can do that. And I, and I know I spoke a lot of words today, God, and I pray that you would erase most of them. And only help us hang on to the one that's relevant. And uh, it, to me, I know what's relevant, God, is that you moved first, that we were created in love, and you have always wanted us to be reciprocating that love to you, but you would never force it on us. So I pray that as we choose it, that a light goes on inside of us, God, that we are transformed from darkness into light, and that through us you make the biggest difference in the world, and that we once again bear your image, and our identity is solidly known in you by our love. We just ask for all these things in your name, Jesus. Amen. Hey, if any, you have any needs that require prayer, please come up and talk to one of our prayer partners. We will see you for the continuation of our Believe series next week. And if you want to talk to me about Discover, come on up.